Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 1. Today, I want to tell you about how we know how many calories your food has in it. You can find that information on practically every package of food that you can buy in a store. But how do we know the calories in each item? In a previous video, I told you about experiments by Antoine Lavoisier and Pierre-Simon Laplace, in which they determined the energy content of food by feeding it to a guinea pig and then putting the little fellow in a calorimeter. That's definitely not how we do it today. In order to get to that, we'll need to finish up our discussion of enthalpy and how to calculate it, which we've been talking about for the past two videos. You may recall that last time we saw that every chemical reaction has an enthalpy. For example, we looked at this reaction, which has an enthalpy of negative 37.1 kilojoules per mole of magnesium hydroxide produced. As we learned last time, if we run this reaction in reverse, the enthalpy changes sign. So for example, the reverse of this reaction would have an enthalpy of positive 37.1 kilojoules per mole. It turns out that this fact is one of the two principles that will allow us to find the enthalpies of thousands of new reactions, even if we're the first people ever to study the reactions. The second principle we need to understand is another pretty simple one. To understand this second principle, let's look at this reaction again, and let's also consider a second reaction, this one, in which magnesium metal reacts with oxygen to form magnesium oxide. You might recognize this reaction. It's one that you might have done in the lab. The reaction of magnesium and oxygen gives off an intense white light that's hard to forget. And because you can see it's giving off light, you can tell it's an exothermic reaction. And the enthalpy proves that this is correct. It's a large negative number, negative 601.8 kilojoules per mole of magnesium oxide formed. So we have two chemical reactions we know the enthalpies for. Now suppose we want to know the enthalpy of a new, different reaction that we've never seen before, like this one. We can combine water, oxygen, and magnesium to produce magnesium hydroxide. And we want to know the enthalpy of this reaction. How can we find it out? The key is to notice that there's a connection between this reaction and the two earlier reactions that we do know the enthalpies of. In that second reaction, we combine magnesium and oxygen, which are also two of the reactants in the reaction we're trying to figure out. That second reaction produces magnesium oxide, and magnesium oxide is a reactant in the first reaction we studied. So imagine that we perform the second reaction, then feed the magnesium oxide we produce into the first reaction. In that reaction, it combines with water to form the magnesium hydroxide. So overall, in those two reactions, we have four reactants, magnesium oxide, water, magnesium, and oxygen. And we have two products, magnesium hydroxide and magnesium oxide. We can write this as one big reaction. All four reactants are on the left, and the two products are on the right. Notice that magnesium oxide appears on both sides of the reaction. When this happens to a compound, we can drop it out of the reaction as though it canceled out. When we do that, look at what's left. This reaction is the same as the reaction that we're studying. The reactants are in a different order, but that doesn't matter. In order to get this result, we added the reactions together. So that's what we'll do to the enthalpies, too. When we add the enthalpies of the two reactions we started with, we get negative 638.9 kilojoules per mole. So that's the enthalpy of the overall reaction we were trying to figure out. What we just saw is an example of the second of the two principles we need in order to find the enthalpy of thousands of new reactions. This principle is called Hess's Law, and it was first proposed by the Swiss-Russian chemist Germain Hess. To summarize it, Hess's Law says that if a reaction can be broken down into a series of simpler reactions, the overall enthalpy is just the sum of the enthalpies of each reaction. That's what we did in the example that we just looked at. We had two simpler reactions, and we added them together 
to form a more complicated one. Let's use these two principles that we just talked about to find the enthalpy of a new reaction. We'll look at the reaction that takes place in an acetylene torch, the kind of torch we use for welding. Here's the reaction. Acetylene and oxygen are the reactants, and we form carbon dioxide and water. We want to know the enthalpy of this reaction, but let's suppose that we don't know it off the bat. In order to get it, we'll need to use a few other reactions that we have information about, like these three. Just as we did in the previous example, we'll find out that we can use the three reactions we know the enthalpies of to find the enthalpy of one that we're interested in. It may not be obvious to you right now how to combine these reactions to get the one that we want. If we just add them together, they don't add up to the reaction we're aiming for. Instead, here's a good rule of thumb that tells us what we should do. Look at the overall reaction you're shooting for and try to find a compound that only appears in one of the reactions that you have information about. For example, the first reactant in our overall reaction is acetylene, C2H2. In the three reactions we have to work with, acetylene only appears in the second reaction. Unfortunately, in that reaction, acetylene is on the product side, and in our target reaction, it's on the reactant side. That means we'll need to flip this second reaction around. Now that we've done that, acetylene and hydrogen are on the left, and C2H6 is on the right. Remember, the first principle we talked about tells us that when you perform a chemical reaction in reverse, like we just did, it changes the sign on the enthalpy. So this new reaction will have an enthalpy of negative 310.5 kilojoules per mole. We're still not done. The acetylene is now on the correct side of the arrow, but our three reactions still won't add to give us the overall reaction that we want. Let's look at the other three compounds in the overall reaction. I said earlier we should start with compounds that only appear in one of the reactions we have to work with. The oxygen appears in both the first and third reactions, so let's not work with the oxygen. The carbon dioxide is a better choice. It only appears in the first reaction. We want two carbon dioxides on the right side in our overall reaction. And right now, there are two on the right side in reaction number one. So those are correct. We don't need to change anything in order for the carbon dioxide to work out. The last compound in our overall reaction is water. Like the oxygen, it appears in both the first and third reactions. We've already fixed the acetylene and the carbon dioxide, so we have no choice now but to fix either the water or the oxygen. It doesn't really matter which one we pick, but I think it's a little easier to work with compounds that don't have fractions for coefficients, so I'm going to try to fix the water instead of the oxygen. So, what can we do to make it so that the three reactions have the correct number of waters? Water appears in both the first and third reactions. Should we change both reactions? or just one of them, and what change should we make? The trick is to remember we already looked at the first and second reactions. We don't want to change either of them right now. We know that the first reaction is the only one with carbon dioxide in it, so if we change it now, we'll mess up the carbon dioxide. And we know that the second reaction is the only one with acetylene, so we don't want to change that one again either. The third reaction is the only one we can change without undoing the work that we already did. So we'll change the third reaction so that we end up with the correct number of water molecules in the overall reaction. The reaction we're aiming for has just one water molecule on the right side of the arrow. If you look at the first two reactions at the top, the two reactions we don't want to change, you can see that there are three water molecules on the right side so far. So we need to make two of those cancel out. That means we're going to need our third reaction to have water on the left side. So we'll flip this third reaction. 
Remember, when we flip the reaction, that means we have to change the sign on the enthalpy. So it is now positive 241.8 kilojoules per mole. But wait, there's now one water on the left in reaction 3, but we need to cancel out two water molecules in the first reaction. To make that happen, we'll need to double everything in the third reaction. If we do, we'll get two waters on the reactant side, and also two hydrogens and one oxygen on the product side. Since we doubled the reaction, that means we also need to double the enthalpy. So it's now positive 483.6 kilojoules per mole. Now that we've done that, we have two waters on the left in reaction 3 and three on the right in reaction 1. So the two waters will cancel out, leaving us with just one on the right side, which is what we want in the overall reaction. So we've now fixed the acetylene, the carbon dioxide, and the water. We can't change any of the three reactions anymore without messing up the number of the three compounds that we've fixed so far. So if we've done everything correctly, the three reactions should now add up to give us the overall reaction that we want. You might be worried because we haven't looked at the oxygens yet, but those should work out now because as I said, there's nothing else we can do to our three reactions without undoing some of the work we already did. So let's see what we get when we add up the three reactions. Remember, compounds that are on both sides of the reactions will cancel each other out so we can drop them from the overall reaction. For example, you can see that C2H6 is on the left side of reaction 1 and on the right side of reaction 2, so those will drop out. Also, there are two hydrogen molecules on the left in reaction 2 and two hydrogen molecules on the right in reaction 3, so those will cancel out. As we mentioned before, there are two waters on the left in reaction 3 and three on the right in reaction 1. That means the two waters on the left will cancel out, and two of the three on the right will also drop out, and that will leave us with just one on the right side. The last thing that will cancel out is oxygen. There are seven halves of oxygen on the left side in reaction one, and one oxygen on the right side in reaction three. So one oxygen will drop out on both sides, which will leave us with five halves on the left side. When we add all three reactions together, we'll get five halves of oxygen and one acetylene on the left. Everything else on the left sides of these reactions has dropped out. On the right side, we have two CO2 molecules and one water, and everything else on the right side has also dropped out. The reaction we got by adding these is exactly the one that we want for our overall reaction. So now at last we're done manipulating these reactions and we can now find the enthalpy of the overall reaction. Hess's law tells us that we get the enthalpy by adding together the enthalpies of the reactions we're adding together. When we do that, we get a total of negative 1255.6 kilojoules per mole. By the way, notice that this is a negative number. You might remember from previous videos that this tells you it's an exothermic reaction. And that makes sense. You know that the burning of acetylene gives off lots of heat and light, so it makes sense that it turned out to be exothermic. There's something else to notice about one of the reactions we looked at in this last example. In this reaction, we formed water from the elements it's made of, hydrogen and oxygen. It turns out that, as you'll see in a minute, it's very useful to know the enthalpy of a reaction where you form a compound from its elements. It's so useful that we give the enthalpy of a reaction like that its own special name, the enthalpy of formation. And we also give it its own symbol, delta HF. To be specific, the enthalpy of formation is the enthalpy of a reaction in which we form one mole of a compound from its elements. For example, take the compound carbon dioxide. CO2 is formed from carbon and oxygen. 
Carbon is just plain C, and oxygen is O2. So the reaction where we form CO2 from its elements is this one. And the enthalpy of the reaction is called the enthalpy of formation for CO2. For another example, suppose we have iron 3 oxide. It's made from iron and oxygen. So the reaction is this. We have iron, Fe, and oxygen, O2, on the reactant side. You may be surprised that the oxygen has a fraction for a coefficient. In previous videos, I told you that when we balance an equation, we usually get rid of any fractions by multiplying the coefficients by whatever's in the denominator. That's still usually going to be true. The only reason we're not doing that this time is because of the definition of the enthalpy of formation. Remember, it's the enthalpy of the reaction where we form one mole of a compound from its elements. So when we write this kind of reaction, we always want the coefficient on the product to be 1, even if that means some of the reactants might have fractions for coefficients. One other thing to notice is that when you're looking up an enthalpy of formation, you should be careful about what phase the compound is. For example, the enthalpy of formation of water that we saw earlier was for water vapor. It turns out that although the chemical reaction looks the same for liquid water and for ice, the enthalpies of the three reactions are all different. This can really alter the results of any calculations you do, so when you look up an enthalpy of formation, make sure you're looking it up for the correct phase. It might seem like the enthalpy of formation and the reactions that it describes aren't really all that useful, but actually they're really important, and we use them a lot in chemical research. You'll see them in lots of homework problems, tests, and quizzes, too. In fact, there's a huge table of enthalpies of formation for hundreds of different compounds in Appendix C of your textbook, and you'll want to use that table when you're working on the homeworks. Here's why they're so useful. Suppose we have a chemical reaction that we want to know the enthalpy of, like this one. We saw earlier that if we know the enthalpies of some other reactions that have the same compounds in them, we can flip them around and manipulate them and then add them together using Hess's law to get the overall enthalpy. But what happens if we don't know any other reactions? Are we stuck then? No, this is where enthalpies of formation come in handy. It turns out that if you have a big table of enthalpies of formation, like the one in Appendix C, we can use it to find out the enthalpy of a reaction like this one, using this simple equation. The enthalpy of any reaction is just the enthalpies of formation of the products minus the enthalpies of formation of the reactants. Let's try that on our reaction. If you look in Appendix C, you'll find out that oxygen has an enthalpy of formation of zero. For this compound, which is glucose, it's negative 1,273.02 kilojoules per mole. For CO2, it's negative 393.5 kilojoules per mole. But we need to be careful about two things with this one. First, we have to subtract the enthalpies of the reactants, so we're going to subtract negative 393.5 kilojoules per mole. Be careful when you're subtracting a negative number. That sometimes throws people off. The second thing to be careful about is that our units here are kilojoules per mole. But in this reaction, we have 6 moles of CO2. So we have to multiply the enthalpy of the CO2 by 6. We really should have done that for the oxygen, too, because oxygen also has a coefficient of 6. But the enthalpy of that one was 0, so it didn't really matter if we multiplied the 0 by 6. Finally, we'll also need to subtract the enthalpy of formation of water, which is negative 285.83 kilojoules per mole. Once again, we have to multiply that by 6 because the reaction tells us there are 6 moles of water. Also, remember, when you're looking up this number, we have to get the enthalpy of formation for liquid water. 
not water vapor. So be sure you're looking at the right phase when you look it up in the appendix. Anyway, when we perform the calculation, we get a result of positive 2,803.0 kilojoules per mole. Notice that this is a large positive number, which means that this is an endothermic reaction. This makes a lot of sense if you look at what the reaction actually is. Those of you who have taken some biology classes may have recognized that this is the reaction that happens during photosynthesis. Plants take up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and water from the ground, and they produce oxygen and this molecule, which is glucose. Plants require plenty of energy in the form of sunlight in order to perform this reaction, and that need to absorb energy is one way you know that it must be an endothermic reaction. Actually, this last reaction is also interesting for another very different reason, and this time it's connected to the way we determine the number of calories in our food. Suppose we reverse this reaction. As you know, that means we would change the sign on the enthalpy, so now it would be negative 2803.0 kilojoules per mole. But this is the overall chemical reaction that occurs when you metabolize glucose. Now, metabolic reactions are definitely a lot more complicated than this, but overall, this is the overall reaction that tells you what's happening when you consume glucose. And Hess's law tells us that all the many chemical reactions that happen in your body when you consume glucose all add up to give you this reaction. So, if you were to eat a mole of glucose, it would release 2,803 kilojoules of energy. Usually, we don't keep track of how many moles of something we eat. Instead, we keep track of how many grams. If we use the periodic table, we can convert moles to grams, and we find out that when we eat glucose, we get 15.56 kilojoules per gram of glucose that we ate. In fact, this is a common way of determining how many calories are in different kinds of food. It turns out that carbohydrates and proteins both give us about 17 kilojoules of energy per gram. You'll notice that this is a bit different than the 15.56 that we just saw for glucose, but that's because the 17 kilojoules is an average for lots of different carbohydrates, not just glucose. Fats, on the other hand, give us about 37 kilojoules per gram, more than twice as much as the carbohydrates and proteins. Now, usually, food labels give us this energy in calories, not kilojoules. It turns out that there are 4.184 kilojoules in a calorie. If you convert the energies for these three types of nutrient from kilojoules into calories, you find that carbohydrates and proteins give us 4.1 calories per gram, and fats give us 8.8 .8 calories per gram. You can see how this works by looking at the nutrition label on almost anything you buy in a grocery store. For example, here's the label on a can of soup. It tells us that the soup contains 23 grams of protein, 25 grams of carbs, and 9 grams of fat. We can use that information to calculate the number of calories in it. When we do, we find out that the soup should contain 276 calories, and that's pretty much what the label says. The discrepancy is probably partly because of the rounding errors in the way they reported the amount of fat, protein, and carbs in the soup. Well, that's enough new material for one video. When we talk again, we'll look at energy a bit more, but instead of heat, we'll be looking at light and how light can change what atoms and molecules do. So until next time, have a good week.